Whatever your passion, it needs to include postural care, presented to you today by Sarah Clayton and Rachel Wright. Hello and welcome. It's so good to see you. We are here to talk to you all about postural care and why postural care needs to be something that you're passionate about. You might not be as passionate as the person I'm just about to introduce you to because she is slightly obsessed, but we hope that you're going to be a little bit more excited than you were just before you started um, about postural care. But the most passionate person about postural care that I know, <laughs> if there could be any more peace in that sentence, it would be amazing, is Sarah Clayton. Hello. I love that that whole thing as soon as you say postural care and I've just got this image of, of people going oh I'll just sit myself up a little bit taller the whole postural care thing is not about sit up straight um hopefully we'll get a little bit more information today and a little bit more across about the idea that this is I think the whole the whole posture thing's got such a bad press hasn't it you know it sounds it all sounds a little bit yeah you're not doing x y z um so my you are right, I am a bit obsessed. It started years and years and years ago. My mum calls herself a recovering physiotherapist, worked in a huge institution, um, and literally says that she had people from a children's, you know, from children right the way through. Um, and a, a massive privilege for her, the position she was in, she could see the way that people's bodies change shape over time. My dad was a uh, weapons and explosives uh, specialist in the army, I know. So useful. Um, but an engineer. So he ended up uh, thinking about equipment. And so I've grown up in this house where my body symmetry has been measured more times than I'd like to admit. I've been put into prototypes of chairs and night positioning and all of these things. So yeah, I admit it. I'm a fully fledged member of the postural care cult. Massive. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> what about you, Rachel? So I could um, never talk about postural care ever again in my whole life, quite happily, um, oh. because <laughs> um, Ooh, nice I was one here. of those people who was thinking that postural care was like this and, you know, the beads in the back of your car, your big fancy brown beads from the 80s, <laughs> or your like your desk, you know, whether you got one of those quite adjustable desks or whatever. Um, and that was until... Um, despite being a, a nurse, that was it was only until my son was born who has got really complex needs. And um, 16 years ago, he was born and suddenly, well, actually not suddenly, it kind of dawns on you a little bit. Postural care isn't like a, he's got a diagnosis of cerebral palsy or yeah. he's registered blind or he's, um, you know, needs to have support with feeding. It's so much more of a dawning. Mm. Um, but then it's a little bit like yeast. It gets into everything and it changes everything so i couldn't just like put him into a chair and that was his postural care done and then i couldn't just um put him in a stander because that was his postural care done and um, there were so many components because it's not at a certain moment in time in the same way gravity's there 24 hours a day my son's muscular patterns and his his the impact of his um complexities are there 24 7. Yeah. And therefore the postural care and the support that's required is 24 7. so i um live and breathe it in my life um and i love sarah enough to still talk about it when I could be drinking tea and eating cake instead. There you go. And we are absolutely delighted that you have decided to hang around and stay because your name is on the title. And it would have been, and it would have been it uncomfortable. Would have been um, so the postural care stuff is really badly defined, isn't it? People kind of don't necessarily know what it is. It's, it's that if someone finds it difficult to move, then we need to be providing support 24 hours a day in order to protect them from the predictable effect of gravity. So just that squashing, constant squashing. It's also to do with mobility. And we know that because it's not very well defined, because it covers loads of different practitioners, every, you know, it seems everybody's got a little bit of responsibility around it. It's really difficult and service provision, we know, and we'll talk about a little bit later, has been massively impacted by COVID, but it was also tricky beforehand. 
So we've got a lot of work to do, but that's okay because we're kind of like that, aren't we? Parents of, I'm, I'm so I forgot to say, I'm a, a wife of one, mum of four, and my oldest has a complex brain injury. And if you want something doing, ask a parent of a child or a young person or an adult with disability, because I guarantee you. Uh, as persistent as gravity. They'll get more done. Yeah, exactly. They'll get more done in less time than anybody else. But the reality so, is, the, the reality is for families like us is that despite it being 2020, despite us living in a very, um, you know, affluent part of the country, world even comparatively, mm -hmm. there still are big um, gaps in the provision that's given for postural care whether or not you get a wheelchair what that wheelchair is like do you get it funded with vouchers do you get it um assessed and given exactly what you need do you have to wait three months for it or three years for mm. it as it was reported earlier not that long ago on the bbc news cycle um it's it's unfortunate that despite postural care being the platform on which people with limited movement and complex disabilities accesses the rest of their life from yeah. education to the outside world to fun to socializing all those things are accessed through the capacity and the ability for them to be given po good postural care and their bodies being protected for the future despite that our services are very quite our, our piecemeal and we'll talk about that a little bit but i know that my responsibility as somebody who provides postural care for my son all the time can yeah. feel overwhelming and relentless and and really really tricky like it's it's lots and lots of different people it's lots and lots of different bits of equipment it's lots of things to coordinate and then you have the crises that end up us up in hospital um, and yeah. because things haven't been done and things haven't been put in place and i realized that that responsibility of mine is not just actually down to me and um, being empowered you know <laughs> I hear that around a lot like I've empowered the parents to do it themselves yeah <laughs> okay. so what you said is you said it's not your job um but it isn't everybody's working really really hard and the way in which we do empower responsibility whether that's a parent or the practitioner or the manager or whatever else is to enable those people to have the authority the agency and the resources with which to do it we've all gone into work and thought oh i've got too much to do today and my computer's not working like how am i going to get my job done because my computer's not working i can't as a parent of a child with complex needs provide good postural care if I don't have the authority to make decisions about how that's done, if I haven't got the understanding or the training or the knowledge with which to know what good looks like, yeah. or I haven't got the, the equipment, I haven't got the Absolutely. time or the energy in order to provide good care. Absolutely. And when we think about, um, so if we think about, so we've got, we know that a huge responsibility sits with parents. If we're thinking about children, it sits with parents. If we're thinking about adults, it sits with support, you know, kind of um, uh, support workers and, and people, you know, within residential care services. So um, let's just have a think about if it's all right with you. And like, we didn't plan this earlier. Can I just one of the things that people sometimes think is postural care is all about gravity and protecting structures. Let's think about like a sensory side of it. Okay. So not only are we thinking about protecting a structure, we're also thinking about how we feed a person's brain with information to help them to then access the outside world. So there is a term called paratonia and it's one of these things that people, you, you might not hear it very often, but paratonia is the muscle tone. So when we think about tone, we're thinking about um, whether a muscle is tight or whether it's relaxed. So paratonia is when we have high tone, so tight muscles, but it's as a response to the person's brain not knowing where that person is. Now that's a really hard, I can see from Rachel's face. You may not be able to see Rachel's face. Rachel's face is like, Huh? So this is a sensory thing. Postural care is a sensory thing for everybody in schools. So if we don't know where we are, 
in space, then our body has to tell us where we are. And that's really hard to get your head around if you've got a good proprioception. So proprioception is our sense of where we are in the world and in relation to other things. So in the dark, in the cinema, you can put your hand into the popcorn and you'll get it into the popcorn and you'll get it to your mouth without, you know, shoving it into your, into your ear or whatever. So if you have got good proprioceptive sense, it's really difficult to imagine not having it. But loads of us have had the experience of having um, dental work and having a, maybe having a, an injection to numb your face. So the first thing, and, and that is a real screw up for your brain, because as far as your brain's concerned, you've, you've lost that part of your body. It's, it's now missing. Um, so what we have to think about is well, how do we respond to that situation? And the way that we respond is that we look at our face, we look in the mirror, we check whether it's the right size. You might poke your own face, you might press it, you might use your tongue and explore the inside of your mouth. You might bite your face to see if you can feel it. Now the rational bit of your brain knows that you went to the dentist, you had an injection, and you're not gonna be able to feel your face until however many hours. But the primitive part of your brain is saying, where the hell have you put your face? There is something very wrong here. So imagine that sense for the whole of your body, all right? So, so imagine your brain not knowing where the rest of you is. And one way that your body can tell your brain where you are is through your muscle tone, is through that, that high tone, or it's through pressing yourself against something. Or it could be, you know, you know kind of in a, a less extreme circumstance, it could be taking your hand down the wall, you know, as you're going down a corridor, constantly checking where things are in relation to you. So postural care is not just about, about gravity, a lot of it is, um, but it's also about helping them to know where they are in the world. And it's about stopping that internal necessary conversation that's going on all the time so that the person can engage with the outside world. And that's what we're about, isn't it? You know, yep. we, otherwise, you know, if you, if you see somebody that's like this, you need to think about them that on a tightrope, they can't concentrate on what you're showing them outside on the on the communication uh, strategy that you're trying to to teach them they just can't because everything is focused on where am i am i falling am i safe whatever your passion is you have to have this underlying you have to have the postural care right underlying everything else the thing from a, from my point of view as a parent is that um i would love to have it as a tick box that I just do it once and then it's done it's like yeah. can we just get the right wheelchair and then that I can tick postural care off my list mm. at least yeah. um, and I've come to realize unfortunately we're spending far too much time with you but that's not the reality because in the no. same way that I can't have any time off um because I still need to feed people and move strewn toys from one point place in the house <laughs> to another for the billionth time um gravity doesn't take time off and neither does um my son's muscle tone and so mm -hmm. requiring that every position he is in needs to be supported unless it's being active you know yeah. unless it's for the purpose of rolling or stretching or you know exploring in a way if he is in a position then it needs to be supported so that he isn't seeking out those other surfaces he isn't finding his tone is higher than necessary he knows where he is and he's got that support yeah um, can i can i can i share this this little girl with you so um this is colleen and you can just see the difference between an unsupported position and a supported position and it, so it's not just about, um, so yes, it's about bones and about growth, but it's also sensory. And it's also about facilitating. If you imagine a chair at the end of Colleen's bed and she's got to make a journey from lying to sitting, 
Now, the more complicated you make that journey, so if you look at the picture of her on her left, we, we'd have to adjust her pelvis, we've got to adjust her leg position, we've got to adjust her head position, we've got to, you know, she, she doesn't look comfortable, and we've got to address all of those things before we can get in, her into a really good seated posture. Or the picture on the right, the journey between lying and sitting is actually really simple there. Now, for some people, if we don't address lying, then the journey between lying and sitting becomes so complicated that it just becomes impossible. And that's, and you know, that's that's not life, is it? If 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 sitting becomes uncomfortable, we can't do it for very long. Uh, your seating system becomes so big and cumbersome that it, it impacts literally the vehicle that you can go into or you know th this is this is an unnecessary kind of layering of, of problems on top of problems you know and, and if we get in there early and we understand what's going on we can address things before they become a big issue and so there we go that's all you need to do good luck and we'll see yeah. you next time if only if only that was that easy i know that um and sarah knows from a from a, an industry point of view and from a parent point of view that we have so many people who are needed for their expertise to make postural care work it isn't just one person's job and it isn't just one perspective that's required in order to get the whole 24-hour period in place and sorted we have ot's and physios and teachers and teaching assistants and specialist service providers and equipment um industry people and and so many people as a parent i can feel like um there's a fantastic woman called brené brown who talks about big industry and business and you know people who do multi-million pound uh sort of companies and caring for my son is not as financially viable and lucrative as some of these massive companies are but it really resonates one of the things in particular that really resonates with me is she talks about conflict horizon and horizon conflict comes into play when there's these different lenses that interfere with how you plan and decide what needs to happen next and so I have a certain perspective. I'm standing on the cliff edge. I've got all these people around me telling me stuff that I need to do. And I've got, you know, the OT talking about the fine motor and making sure he's stable in bed. And I've got the physio talking about the walker and the stander and telling me if you don't do this, you're going to have this, your son's going to have scoliosis or they're going to have just problems with his hips or whatever, whatever. Mm -hmm. And as my lens, at the parent i'm like but i just need him to sleep tonight mm -hmm. you know because i'm being splashed with the waves of overwhelm and fatigue and, and bombardment and and kind of trying to deal with my own place in this story that we find ourselves in and this horizon conflict can be a real issue in the way in which we communicate and work with one another and yeah. that's why I'm really passionate about that bridging the gap between the parents and, and, and the practitioners who support us, because mm, there probably isn't anything more in my son's life than postural care that requires the level of collaboration and communication that is needed. Yeah. And if it's neglected or not even neglected, if it isn't run well if it isn't coordinated if it isn't resourced if i haven't got the capacity and the authority and the agency and all this stuff i talked about with regards to empowerment then unfortunately what can be one of the final p's like we talked about the paratonia and the proprioception we've talked about it being person-centered and all these things that are really important but if we don't get it right actually it can lead to premature death and there is evidence around leader and the statistics that are really um, they're really, hot, you know, brutal. Um, another one of Brené's um, terms is clear as kind. Um, and that's even true when the clear truth of something is painful. It's still kinder for me to know that reality um and do what's within my power to make it not the case than to be mollycoddled and protected from it 
and look back and think if only someone had said so in order to um but that i mean i'm not suggesting that's easy i know as a parent and with sam we we have our own complications this is not a magic wand get it all fixed kind of thing i think one of the things though rachel around that idea of premature death is that there can be a sense of inevitability because because the evidence is there that um, chest infections and pneumonia and aspiration pneumonia, more than 40% of premature deaths of people with learning disabilities in 2019 were those two causes. And we know that positioning has a, has a huge impact. But one of the things that we need to be really aware of is that this is not inevitable. And, and like you say, that clear, you know, clear is kind because it gives people a really good understanding of, of their roles and responsibilities about how we are going to avoid this, this car crash. You know, when you think of the crash test dummy, I think back and, you know, if you think of crash test dummy, remember the videos of the seventies and watching the crash test dummy and thinking about when we were young, you didn't even have seatbelts in the back of the car. So those education programs, those, this is what happens without this intervention helps people to see, right, okay, so I see that it's a really serious consequence, but I see that there is a way through. And that's something that really came about, didn't it, when we did the posture positive yeah. report. Um, so Rachel and I were commissioned by NHS England to look at the impact of COVID on postural care services. Um, and it was one of, the, one of the big lessons that we learned was that people are desperate to work together. People want to work together. So, so people that are providing that hands-on postural care, the parents, the support workers, are wanting to work in collaboration with the physios and the OTs and the people who are, you know, kind of the, the gateway to the equipment or, you know, whatever it is that, that they're needing. So the Posture Positive report, you can access um, on Rachel's website, um, which is bornattherighttime.com. Go to my website and look at that document. It's all about standardisation, coordination yeah. and collaboration. That's what came out. What came out is that we need to decide what good looks like and, and agree that between us. We need to work together and coordinate services so that families know what to expect, when to expect it and things. And we've got to collaborate as, as people within that system to make things happen. Yeah. Um, and it was uh, once we would picked ourselves up from the reality of that report, because it was brutal in places um, and it was disheartening in places, um, what Sarah and I wanted to do with that report was not sit and wallow and eat cake. Actually, we might have done that first. I think, I think we did quite a lot of that. Yeah. There was a lot of a lockdown, a lot of lockdown cake. That's quite hard to say. Lockdown. I was chatting to someone. Else. Like, eh, I've got a little bit of lockdown lard. I'm like, <laughs> that's what's going on with my trousers at the minute. Yeah, so, we've all had a bit um, of that. Once we'd um, insulated ourselves slightly more through lockdown we worked out what can what is it that we need to do what is it that we can do to make the reality of this agency authority um, resources how can we put that into the hands of people who need it and so we have developed training for practitioners training for families and the workforce and obviously i work really hard and do training and stuff on communication and co-production because it's, we've got to do it together we've got to equip the professionals with the knowledge they need and we need those people who are moving people if you move a person from yeah. their chair to a bed or to do an activity then you are hands-on and therefore you need to know is that right is that not right what am i looking for that makes it a good position or a bad position exactly. and so we have two different three different courses really we've got the cradle to grave course which is for those people who have been trained in postural care or have training in in biomechanics and things like that and um, we will take you the whole way through so if you haven't got a lot of background but you want to get this level of knowledge it is it is absolutely possible we'll go through all the jargon the lingo and all that kind of stuff but that's for people to um really get to grips with how do you transform your practice so that you're bringing about really positive change for people who have postural care needs then there's the workforce training which is for those hands-on people the the, the hands-on training is like a workshop so you've got one hour a week of watching videos you've got one hour 
a week of doing some activities together and that will enable you to hopefully become an alarm system for that person that you support to know when something needs to do and when to get those other people in to make changes and support but also to be able to do that stuff thinking yep that person's in a good position in bed or oh it's not i'll get someone else who might be able to help um and then there's the family like you know we're training families we're training parents like me siblings and um, grandparents have been on the course and um, because if we are loving our people we want to do it as best as we can and um, if anybody deserves the knowledge the skills and the confidence for postural care it's the people that do it the most and that is the people who are doing it on christmas day and new year's day and bank holidays and weekends and that's those families those parents so what are you gonna do now we are going to give we've given you these different opportunities to train to equip yourselves sarah and i did the posture positive report and we decided what next and we decided the next right thing was to develop these courses and we just want to inspire you to decide what the next right thing is for you is it to head over to the website and read the posture positive report is it to go and grab a piece of cake is it to lie down and um have a nap or is it to book yourself onto one of the training courses? <laughs> we if you're going to lie down and have a nap, make sure that you've got your legs lovely and well supported. <laughs> make sure that you, you know, Aww. you see, you laugh about it, but I, I do. Laugh. I know I have my little positioning system for myself. I have reached a certain age, it's not but surprising. we hope very much that we've given you a brief introduction into why, you know, what might sound like a really um, Swiss finishing school, dull posture, sit up straight, da da da. Hopefully, we've helped you to see it's a sensory thing. It's a bio, you know, it's it is a bones and structures thing, which if it goes wrong, it can have really serious consequences. But it's more than anything, it's a collaboration thing, um, a real life thing. Absolutely, absolutely, and we all of us have got a role to play in it. It's that postural care army, isn't it, Rachel? You talked the other day about we need more eyes, we need more hands, we need more ears. Um, so please do head over to Rachel's website, bornatherighttime.com. See, I've got Bart in my head there, which is what I see when I see it written down, bornatherighttime.com. And we would love to uh, hear from you. You okay. can also join us um, for talking about the great stuff you're doing or asking questions and support over on Posture Positive at Facebook. Um, and yeah, thank you for spending the time with us this morning, afternoon, evening, whenever it is that you watch this. <laughs> and we look forward to bumping into you again sometime soon. All the best. Bye. Take care. Bye. Bye. This PMLD conference presentation has been presented to you by Rachel Wright and Sarah Clayton. You can find Rachel on her website at bornatherighttime.com and Sarah at simplestuffworks.co.uk.